So today we're going to have three speakers. And so I am going to start now so we can actually get all three in. Um, so the class stops talking when the teacher's talking. Uh, thank you. Um, and so we're gonna talk about semantic parsing today um, and semantics in general. Um, and the interesting thing about semantics is that, uh, the interesting thing about semantics is that um, uh, for a lot of tasks, you just try as hard as possible not to work with semantics at all. So it's, it's just a fancy name for meaning because it's really hard and a lot of times it, it doesn't work in general. Um, and so things like translation and speech recognitions and things like that, a lot of times just totally ignore any, any attempt to have any meaning. But the other task, well, first of all, it's actually why people talk. And so in some sense, it would be important to be able to do it. And the other thing is that for tasks like talking to robots or talking to Siri and having to do something, it's really got to know what you mean, right? If you, if you tell a robot, go in the kitchen and bring me the coffee pot, the robot has to know what a coffee pot is and how to pick one up. It has to know where the kitchen is. It has to know what going and getting something is. And it has to know how to put those meanings together, right? And so for a really, really simple sentence, it could guess. But for a lot of things, you really can't guess the right answer. And so for a lot of purposes, you really have to handle meaning, even though it's difficult. Um, and one of the things that makes meaning really hard is that actually people say very little uh, when they communicate. They're assuming that the person they're talking to typically is an adult human being. Uh, they know what fingers are, they know how to walk, you know. Um, and so there's all this information that they just assume you already know. So like when you get a newspaper story, the newspaper story might say something like, Biden talked to somebody at the Capitol and blah, blah, blah. They don't tell you who Biden is at this point. They don't tell you what a Capitol is. They don't tell you how governments work, right? They, they give you a little bit of extra information on top of all the things you already know. And similarly, like in a restaurant, you get this sheet of paper with like descriptions of food and like money uh, amounts. And they don't tell you that you have to pay for food in a restaurant. They don't tell you what food is. They don't tell you how to eat, right? There's all these things that are not listed anywhere on the menu. They just assume you know that they're selling you food and how that works. Um, and similarly, if, if you get a, a programming manual that tells you how to use some new piece of software, um, it doesn't tell you what programs are or you know, what a computer is. Uh, it assumes some level of knowledge already. It just adds a little bit of information on top of that. And so that makes it hard to, to understand things. And one, Interesting thing that happened early in the uh, history of AI is somebody thought it'd be a good idea to start with children's stories because that, that might be easier, right? But in children's stories, trees can talk and people fly around on carpets and stuff, and that's all okay. So it's, it's actually much harder than doing adult stuff from the newspaper because there's all this weird stuff that's just okay. Um, and so this is a big part of the problem. Uh, and so when you're, when you're trying to produce the meaning of a sentence, what you're typically trying to do is you're trying to convey the meaning in the sentence. And that is usually, or almost always, a, a representation of some part of the world. Um, and two things to very quickly mention, just in case you run into this later, linguistic, linguistic people will talk about pragmatics versus semantics. And there's really just two kinds of meaning. Semantics is the specific meaning of a specific sentence, taken very uh, literally usually. Whereas pragmatics is, other things about the world that you need to know in order to interpret the sentence. And so they draw a line there, which may or may not really exist, uh, but people will talk about pragmatic versus semantics. So you should just understand that's a distinction. The other thing is sometime you'll run into a philosopher at a party and if you say you're working on a, a meaning representation, they'll shake their head and laugh and say, oh, you poor fool, you know, that's not possible, that's not possible. Uh, you know, and, uh, so the thing to know is that when, when philosophers talk about semantics, when they talk about the semantics of Robert Frederick, they mean me, <laughs> this, this you know, piece of uh, live material here. So for philosophers, the semantics of something is the thing it's actually talking about. The semantics of going to the store is actually someone going there. It's not another representation. That doesn't matter for us because we use representations all the time, uh, but you know, it's a good thing to know in case someone someday tries to make you feel like an idiot. You say, well, no, no, I know no, that was fine. Um, and so in today's class, we're gonna first start by looking at first order logic, which is kind of the, 
the, the, the, the biggest enterprise I'm trying to represent meaning from language. Uh, who already knows first order logic or has heard of it? Uh, yeah, the same four linguists. Okay, a few more people, good. Um, yeah, so um, it's an important thing to understand how it exists, partly because, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. So it's also called first order predicate calculus, or some people call it logical form. Um, and there's been a lot of work on this uh, going back to like uh, 2000 years ago, um, but also a lot of work in mathematics since the 1800s. This is one of those strange fields where there are citations of things in the 19th century. Um, and uh, if you've heard of Boolean logic or like Boolean variables, that's named after George Boole, who's one of the guys who worked on this back then. Um, and what the mathematicians wanted to do, this is another thing that the mathematicians invented before there were computers. They were upset because they would sometimes prove things and everyone would accept the proof. And a few years later, someone found a mistake. And this proof that they all thought was true is not true anymore. And obviously for mathematicians, it's very upsetting. They, they want the true things to stay true. And so they were looking for a mechanical way of automatically verifying that a proof is true without depending on unreliable people. You know, you convince all your friends you prove something that's not good enough for, for like real mathematicians, that you want to you have a proof that is like really true. Uh, and so in doing that, they kind of invented set theory and a number of other things that, that are widely used. Uh, and so there's like very deep connections to a lot of uh, mathematical things. And the, the, the most generally used form of semantics is called model theoretic semantics. And what you're basically doing, and we'll get we'll go through some details of this in a minute, um, is you have a set, you have sets of objects, you have sets of properties of these objects, and you've got relations between objects. Um, and these are all defined in terms of sets of, of specific constants, basically. Um, and the meaning of a particular constant is the thing in the world that it refers to. So you often use names, so like if there's a variable Bob, a constant Bob, it refers to me, but in the context of the machinery of logic, it's just a constant. And so the different objects in this domain are just a big set of constants. And so mapping the symbols in this domain into what they really mean is called uh, having an interpretation. Um, and just like in uh, programming languages, or you, have, you have names that you make up for your variables and your functions. So those are the non-logical vocabulary that describe the objects. And just like there are reserved words in programming languages, uh, you have the logical vocabulary that's used to assemble or compose these individual objects meanings into a bigger meaning. Like go get, go get the, the coffee pot from the kitchen, right? In you know, this kind of framework, there'll be an object representing the kitchen, an ob object representing a coffee pot. And then there's the idea of going and getting something will be a, a, a relation. Um, and so we'll see how that works in a second. So this model uh, that we're gonna go through basically has like people and restaurants and kinds of food as the objects. And so from the position of the machinery of the model, these names are just, just constants. That's all we really know about them. So Noah, Karen, Rebecca, and Frederick, Green Mango, Pazba, Udipi, Thai, Mediterranean, and Indian, they're all just constants. So the only thing that the machinery knows about is what we tell it about them. And so all the facts about things have to be explicitly given to the machinery. Um, and so one of the things you can have is you have properties. So some restaurants are crowded, uh, Casbah is expensive. I think Casbah is the only one that's still around, but it's still expensive. Um, and then you can have relations between objects in the domain. So Karen likes green mango, Fred likes Casbah, everybody likes Udipi, Casbah serves Mediterranean, and so on. So these start to sound like real, like statements about real world facts, right? Assuming that these facts are all true. Um, and so the way that you represent this in the model we just have a set of constants, which is the green, these green uh, letters here. And for uh, a property like crowded, you have a set of all the crowded things named crowded. And so the knowledge of which things are crowded is basically what things are in that set. So every, every crowded thing in the world is in this list. Uh, and similarly, which things are expensive is like another list of all the expensive things. You just have a set with the name expensive 
that has these things in it. And for relationships, you have sets of couples. Uh, and so for a binary relationship, like somebody likes a restaurant, you've got a, a likes relationship and it's just a list of every pair of things where the first thing is a person in the domain and the second thing is a restaurant in the domain. And so you just have this, these uh, group of sets and that defines the, uh, the truth uh, of, the, of the domain. And then you can take English sentences like Karen likes green mango and Frederick likes Cosba. Um, Noah likes expensive restaurants, which is true. Um, not everybody likes green mango. You can take fairly nice sounding sentences and actually develop a, a rigorous mathematical description of the meaning of them. Um, and so the, the way that you combine these objects uh, in the meaning of first order logic, there's things called terms, which are basically these constants there's functions that will take one term and give you another term. And there's variables that range over terms. Then on top of that, we have predicates that tell you what's true in the world. And so expensive and served are both predicates in this domain. Expensive has one argument and serves has two. And just like in programming languages, the order of the arguments matter. And so for serves, the restaurant serves a kind of food. And you have these logical operations that can combine uh, predicates uh, to produce larger predicates. And an important thing to understand is that all of this is done mechanically in the same way that a program is executed on a computer. So the definitions of things like and and or and implies are truth tables, just like for uh, gates in, in, a, in a circuit. Um, and so once you're looking at things this way, uh, the last bit of logic to add is quantifiers. And so in, in classical, so the thing to remember is that classical mathematical logic was invented uh, to represent mathematical ideas. And so things are either true or not true, and they're true forever or not true forever. And, and they're either true of everything, or there's at least one that's true. That's the thing that you care about when you're doing proofs. And so in logic, there are two kinds of quantifiers. There's one that says that there's at least one object for which this statement is true. And the other way is to say that this is true for all objects. And so you can say a restaurant near CMU serves Indian food. And you have this statement that says there exists an X. We don't know what the X is, but restaurant of X is true and near X to CMU is true and serves X Indian is true, right? And if, if those, and so we're saying that there's at least one thing for which those three things are all true. And the truth of it, it's very simple as base. The truth of this is just that these lists, these things are in these lists. So it, it is, you know, there's an object that is a restaurant, it's in the restaurant list. Near X and CMU is in the near list, uh, and X served Indian is in the served list. You can say all expensive restaurants are far from campus. So for all X, um, if X is a restaurant and X is expensive, then it's always the case that X is not near CMU, right? And that captures the, the truth of that statement. And the, the big idea in mathematical logic uh, is that you can take these facts and these quantified statements and make new true things. So if you start with a list of true facts and some true uh, inferences, these, these implies inferences, you can mechanically turn a crank and generate out new true things. Um, and so for example, if you've got in your database uh, that, that Udipi is a restaurant, so it's in the list of restaurants, and you have a statement that says for all X, restaurant of X implies Noah likes X, you can mechanically turn a crank and get this new fact that says Noah likes Udipi, which was implied by the other things, but wasn't really there yet. Right? So you can mechanically turn this crank and produce all these new facts. And the, this was developed over like, you know, hundred years or so, and people got very excited because um, they were able to actually show that if you start with only true things, everything you produce by turning this crank will be true. So that's really important if you're a mathematician, you don't want to prove false things. And they actually proved it's complete. So if you turn this crank long enough, you'll eventually pr prove every true thing. So like, oh, this is great. Does this happen around like 1900 or so? And 
oh great, you know, all the, all the mathematicians can retire. We'll build this big steam powered computer that will like turn this big crank. You know, we'll just produce every true thing like for the rest of history. Uh, they had a hand up. Okay. Yeah, let me know if anyone asks a question in chat. Um, so like, this is great, mission accomplished, all the mathematicians can retire. Well, it turns out that's not true. Um, so even though this is like a monumental great development in the history of uh, math and science, there's a bunch of problems with the traditional approach to logic. The biggest one of which, this isn't in the book, by the way, this is stuff I think is important for you to know. Um, the, this part, uh, the meanings of sentences in this is true values. So I have a white dog and today is Tuesday, both mean the same thing. Okay, that, that's kind of not right. <laughs> Um, also, I've been mentioning these lists of objects, right? And so in traditional logic, the meanings of things are these lists of objects. And you assume that you either know, you know everything is either true or false to start with. That's called the closed world assumption. There's, there's no room for any ambiguous facts or like, I just don't know. Um, and another thing is that there's great thing uh, that it's very bad at handling time varying things or real valued quantities. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Zeno? This Greek philosopher guy, right? So Zeno had these great, they're great things to use at parties, right? So Zeno proved that it's impossible to move. Um, so if, if I'm here and I wanna to get to the door, before I get to the door, I have to get halfway to the door. And before I get halfway to the door, I have to go half that far. And before I go half that far, I have to go half that far. So I have to do an infinite number of things to get to the door, so I'll never get there, okay? And there's actually a Chinese philosopher who, who had the same proof. Right? And the thing is, it's not that Zeno was trying to like make jokes or be dumb or something. He was actually fighting with the guys that were invent inventing this originally and saying, if I can prove stupid stuff, then there's something wrong with your system, right? So he had like 10 different stupid things he could prove. Um, and so that's a problem. Um, and, uh, but like the two biggest problems, one is that um, uh, if you get one false fact in the system, it all collapses and you can prove everything. One wrong fact about everything and day is night, one equals zero and like everything just blows up. And like in the real world, you're bound to have at least one wrong fact in your system, right? So that's the problem. The biggest problem is that uh, this guy named Gödel caused a lot of trouble, but by, by, he, he spent a lot of effort producing a sentence in logic that says this statement has no proof. So all you have to do is produce that. You don't have to, and he was done. Once he produced that thing and showed that that's really what it meant. Because if, if the statement has a proof, then you've proved a false thing. And that's really bad, right? But if, if it's not true, if it's, if it's not true, then there's a true thing that, if, it, if there is no proof for it, it's a true thing with no proof, right? And the details of this, as a graduate student, it took two whole classes in theory class to explain it. So we're not gonna talk about it. Um, but the idea is, is that the, the inference mechanisms of logic are not great for our purposes. Uh, and so what people do, because people spent so much effort developing all this mechanism, it all kind of works at a basic level. People use a descriptive apparatus of logic, but they don't use the inference mechanism. We don't turn the crank at the mathematicians were hoping to turn, okay? So there's tons more stuff you can say about semantics, but we're trying to get through this very quickly. Uh, and so um, I'm gonna tell you now about how you actually in a kind of classic traditional way, build one of these knowledge representations given a parse, right? So we talked the last two classes about syntax. You take a sentence with a grammar and you manage to uh, produce uh, a logical expression. Um, and uh, the way it works is basically through the idea of compositionality. So you take these individually true bits and figure out how to plug them together based on the syntax of a sentence to produce the meaning that the speaker was trying to produce. So um, the big idea is that you start with a parse tree, you have bits of semantics attached to the rules and bits of semantics in the lexicon. And these rules, take this stuff and assemble it together to produce correct uh, logical descriptions of the things you're talking about. Um, who knows about lambda functions? Okay, so lambda functions, 
for those who don't already know, is basically uh, just a way of creating new anonymous functions on the fly. Uh, and this is really great. This is actually kind of like the right way to do semantics in natural language, a lot of people think. Uh, there's, I first saw this ages ago in something called Montague Semantics. When I saw it, I said, oh, yeah, okay, that works. Yeah. Um, and the basic idea is that you're just producing a function. And so when you have lambda x of something, that will combine with some variable uh, to replace the x inside there with whatever the variable is. So at the bottom here, the lambda x near x cmu, if you take that lambda expression and apply it to the, the object Lulu's noodles, the, all the x's in the formula are replaced because it's a lambda x. And so Lulu's noodles get plugged into the formula everywhere the x is. That's all it is. It's just a kind of uh, argument replacement. It's actually like the original kind. Uh, who knows what list is? Oh, you should go learn list. In, a, in the longer version of this, I go at length about how wonderful list is. List is really cool. Uh, anyhow, we'll jump into the examples so we don't run out of time. Um, so uh, we have this example parse. We're going to assume for the moment that the syntactic parse you know, got just one answer and it was the right one. So Noah likes expensive restaurants. This is a nice parse uh, using a nice normal English grammar. Um, that says this is, you know, uh, expensive is an adjective modifying a plural noun restaurant. The verb likes has two arguments. Noah is the subject and expensive restaurants is the object of the verb. Okay, that's what this part says. Um, and the logical formula that we'd like to find is for all X, restaurants X and expensive X implies that Noah likes it. Right? That, that's what this sentence means at a kind of a basic level. And one thing that people often do to make things easier in examples, we just assume that names name unique objects. So the meaning of Noah is Noah. Uh, one thing that uh, logicians like to do at parties sometimes is they'll say, what's the meaning of life? And they'll say, life prime, and then they'll all laugh. Because <laughs> you know, then logicians will put a little prime mark, so you know which one is the meaning, which one is the name. So we're going to see how to construct this uh, uh, in a uh, uh, mechanical way. So each of the lexical entries has a, a meaning attached to it in red on this slide. Uh, Noah is Noah. The things in, in curly braces are the semantic part. So each of the syntactic rules has a semantic part attached to it. And we'll see how these combine to give you the meaning you want. Uh, and these are, especially for verbs and conjunctions, these formulas are carefully constructed to do the right thing when you combine things according to the syntax. Is an engineering job here. So the first thing you do is you take the uh, the uh, semantic attachments from the lexicon and you plug them onto the uh, parts of speech here. Then you take a look at the uh, grammar rules, and each of the grammar rules will have a semantic attachment too. And so for an, uh, a proper noun, it's very simple. It just says that the semantics of the whole things is the semantics of the the leaf. And for an adjective and a noun in a noun phrase, all it says is that you can join the meanings of the adjective and the noun. So a brown cow is something that's brown and a cow. A tall brown man is somebody who's tall and brown and a man. So um, we take these uh, uh, pieces of meaning from the uh, grammar and we apply them to the leaves. And now the subject just becomes the meaning of Noah. And the noun phrase is now lambda x, expensive x, and restaurant x. And that's just combining the meanings of restaurant and expensive based on how adjectives work in English. So then the verb has this kind of complicated form that basically makes uh, the, the, um, the noun phrase object of the verb be the correct argument of the verb. And so when you apply that, you basically get an extra layer of uh, lambda variables uh, and it introduces the predicate likes because the verb likes connects to the predicate likes, which means the thing that verbs like like. Um, and finally, at the top level, um, there's a, a rule attached to uh, sentences that have subjects that just makes the, uh, uh, it applies the, the semantics of the verb that you've got so far, the verb phrase, to the subject. And so when you apply, 
when you apply the uh, lambda y uh, an expression to Noah, Noah gets substituted in for any y's in there. And so you can see Noah gets stuck into the middle of the likes predicate. So the purpose of these lambda variables on the front, just like the arguments in the procedure, uh, is to uh, substitute the, uh, the uh, actual arguments at runtime into the formal arguments in the formula. Right? It's, it's just like how programming is. And so that worked. Uh, you know, the, uh, the formula you get at the end is the one you're hoping to get, and that gives the logical form to this sentence. Um, now, of course, in real life, there's ambiguities and, and you know, this might be uh, uh, various kinds of problems, but uh, in principle, this is how this works. Is that clear? So I think I'm done, right? <laughs> it's five of, well, I suppose that's just a finish at five of, I think. Yeah. Okay, so there's much, much more stuff to tell you about, as you can see in the remainder of the slides. The important thing to realize is that you can actually do real sentences with this kind of formula. This is an actual sentence from a translation system years ago. You know, one of the most successful of these institutions is Banco Sol in Bolivia, right? So like all the meaning and, and some other random stuff in that sentence is captured. So the, this stuff can actually work in practice. And with that, I will call up our second speaker. Frank. So, so I just have one extra comment, oh, yes, please. Uh, here, which is like, I, I think there's a lot of uh, things that make using symbolic knowledge representation difficult in some ways, but on the other hand, there are some really interesting things you can do, like the forward reasoning for yeah. in backward data, which, Really, you know, like a uh, language model cannot do now. You say, like, all, you know, all people are, uh, all people have two feet, prefer expensive mm -hmm. restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, or what is it? Like, all, um, all rich people prefer expensive restaurants. Um, no one is a poor person. Does no one prefer an expensive restaurant? Mm -hmm. um, your language model will say yes or no, where your logical representation will say, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have the information to tell that statement or something like that. And it can also say that with confidence, right? Right, so right. I think it's it's actually pretty uh, it's there's a lot of depth that went into like the stuff that you can do with reasoning over these representations that you definitely cannot capture in a model validator. Or there are some attempts to do so, but they're very rudimentary compared to what like I think it's an interesting topic. Yeah. 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 Implicitly, I was telling you this because I think it's useful. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, and I am not a logician, I should say, I'm not a linguist either, right? You know, but this is stuff that that kind of needs to be reinvented in each new paradigm because it's it's so handy. It's, you know, and and the other main thing to realize is that if you run into an issue with like representing meaning, you don't have to start from scratch, right? There's 200 years of work on this, and so maybe someone thought about that problem. Already. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, so Bob talked a lot about the first order logic, and I'm also going to give an overview about the model of the semantic parsing with a special focus on turning natural language into executable programs. So as an overview, semantic parsers are important components in developing natural language interfaces to our computational agents. In recent years, we have seen like exciting progress in this avenue. Indeed, the advance of you know the advancements of semantic parsing research is making a real impact on people's everyday life. As you can see here, uh, now nowadays commercial virtual assistant could help us accomplish simple tasks. And in the near future, in the right, uh, we hope that programmers could also benefit semantic parse from semantic parsing research. When they are using programming languages, they are not familiar with the toolkit directly translate their natural language intents to source code instead of uh, searching for Google. So, sem semantic. 
More formally speaking, semantic parsing considers the task of transducing natural language utterances, especially a user issued query or question into machine executable code. So, or machine executable form of meaning representations. I will show you more details how this meaning representation is defined. So one important property of meaning representations is that they have strong structures. For example, the lambda, um, the lambda function here defines a function that represents the information need represented in the natural language. Show me a uh, price from Pittsburgh to Seattle. So this is using a lambda function with three conjunctive constraints and right. So it is written in this style as expression and could be easily parsed by programs. So depending on the task considered, the meaning reputation can be defined using a domain specific grammatical formalism. For example, in the fried booking scenario we just seen. So, and the corresponding meaning representation is a database query defined under the Lambda calculus logic form. So here's an left or in a more general or broad setting in the code generation task, where we translate the programmer's natural language intent into a piece of source code implementing uh, intermediate implementation written in a general purpose programming language like in Python. So here the meaning representation is basically the source code. While general purpose meaning representations are designed to capture, you know, the uh, general meaning of a natural language sentence, it is a broad coverage annotation schema to capture the general meaning of a text. So Bob talked about one form of them. And in this lecture, I'm going to focus on the first one. So which is machine executable meaning representations that can be used to directly execute uh, by a computational agent. So, which is the left part. And let's first look at the workflow of a semantic parser to get a better idea of how these semantic parsers could be used in real world conversational AI systems. So uh, at the very beginning, the user, the user have a natural language query like show me flights from Pittsburgh to Seattle. And usually the first step is to understand the question. So the semantic parser parses the natural language query to a new representation here represented in that lambda calculus. And then we need to have a knowledge source or something to execute the program against. And then we have the execution result and then the agent could provide the user with their answers. So in the previous slides, I showed a specific example of how a semantic parser could be used in fried booking scenario. Indeed, there are a lot of tasks that, you know, and benchmarks where we could deploy a neural parser. So now I will do a quick introduction of the commonly used data set in this area of research. Of course, there are big companies like Google, Alexa to train Siri or Amazon Alexa on a proprietary. But here from these data set, we can get a general sense of how the user's real queries are like. To give you a more concrete idea of the semantic parsing task, and how a semantic parser is used in different applications. So I will say we first start from the domain specific or task oriented languages. So the first part is about basically very domain specific. Geo, query 80s and jobs are the three most commonly used or the oldest data sets to evaluate semantic parser. They are small with only about a hundred, few hundreds to a few thousands of examples. And they are basically the domain specific question answering tasks. And this is asking like geographical information, flights or job database. So more recent tasks, that a more recent task that has gained increasing popularity is text to SQL. So some of them might be interested in uh, like working this as a course project as uh, I have seen. So in this task, the input to the system is a query together with a database on which we need to execute the query. So the left part is the input. You have the utterance and also the database schema. So in this case, the parser need to process both the utterance as well as the schema and generate a, a, sec, a SQL query 
that is valid. So those SQL queries can be quite complex sometimes. As you can see, it's a pretty simple natural language utterance, but the actual SQL query that, that are required to answer this question is pretty complex. So these means that these uh, like tasks are pretty challenging and they sometimes involve operations like joining multiple tables. Spider is one such data set with more than 10,000 utterances annotated for 200 databases. So the nice, thing, the nice thing about Spider is that each database has its own domain specific schema. So the, other, the, the tables are like unique for each database. And uh, so in order, and also the test, uh, during testing the database schema are unseen during training. So in order to achieve strong performance, the parser needs to, lo to learn the general recipe of uh, encoding a database schema and perform inference to generate SQL queries rather than simply memorizing or overfitting the training data, which is the schema on like a specific domain. Therefore, it could be viewed as a multi-domain learning task where you train your parser on multiple domains and evaluate its performance on a new domain without annotated training data. So on the right hand side, we have the second uh, category of data sets con that's considered to be more general, basic, which is basic code generation uh, setting. Um, like, uh, we have a data set that is called Konada. It is one such example of a natural language code generation data set. So as you can see here on the left side, we have some examples. These examples are created from Stack Overflow. They are popular questions that people may ask. So it ref reflects the real world use cases of programmers, especially novice programmers, the kind of questions they would ask when they are coding. So this data set, although it's not an extremely huge data set, is uh, quite challenging and because even for a very strong system, it still fails and we have very low exact match accuracy for the output of the program. So having talked a lot about the common benchmark data sets, uh, let's dive into the details of modeling. So I will introduce different semantic parsing models based on how they are trained and what data they are using. So the most straightforward learning paradigm, uh, of course, is supervised learning where a parser is trained on the parallel data of source natural language intent and is labeled target programs. So basically all the training data contains pairs like this. So one straightforward way or a naive baseline for, uh, to do this is you can treat this as a translation task where the target languages are the machine executable programs rather than human language. So here we, treat the meaning recognition as if they were text. So this was indeed one of the early adaptations of neural sequence to sequence models to different NLP tasks. There were once there was a time where you can apply sequence to sequence model to almost any task you want and get a paper. But now the time, and now the low hanging fruits are over. Um, so, uh, of course, there are issues uh, with predicting linearized programs because uh, mean reputations, as they're defined, they have a strong underlying structures. Like if it's a database query or a Python program, they have structures, they have syntax. So the issue with using vanilla sequence to sequence model ignore the rich uh, structures of mean reputations and could generate invalid outputs that are not trees, which are syntactically invalid and those cannot be executed. So causes, uh, so this will cause errors. So one core research questions for um, better models is how to add inductive biases to networks to better capture the structures of a program. There are multiple ways of doing this. We have two work here, like uh, how to encode utterances uh, and also to predict programs following task specific program structures. So adding inductive biases here means that design a new, to, meet, to design neural decoders that reflect the structures of program or make use of the structures as prior knowledge for better prediction. One way that actually works really well is that if you have spe uh, specially designed neural components or let's say decoders or predictors 
for each component in your target program, then this would work well. This is a very strong duck device, but the problem with this is that this really cannot scale because you need to design components for each part of the program. If this program is pretty complex, then you are out of luck. So some previous models improved the process by designing better decoders or capture structures, but still they ignore a very important aspect of meaning representations. And uh, not only do they have structures, but those structures strictly follow a syntax or grammar. So how can we leverage this kind of grammar or syntax to uh, get a better performance? So the key idea here is to use the grammar of the target meaning representation, for example, for Python, which is programming language, it has abstract syntax trees as prior symbolic knowledge in the neural sequence to sequence model. So given a natural language input, we want to generate an AST tree directly out of it. So uh, here, in order to generate tree structured AST with the grammar of the programming language, so we can generate the tree as a, like, as a step by step process. So we factorize the generation process of an AST into a sequential applications of apply rule. So apply rule here means apply a production rule to the frontier node. So the production, so you can see in the animation here at the very beginning, we only have, so we only have root node. And then we just, uh, uh, the model will actually predict actions on the right hand side and one action is a, like a tree building action where you can construct an AST. So let's say we continue this process and grow the derivation using a sequence of apply rule actions. So once we have multiple frontier nodes in this derivation, so we have like three children here and we can always grow, we always grow the leftmost node. So in this case, the first expression node of the call node. So therefore our generation process is actually a pre-order tree traversal of the target AST. So once we reach the terminal node, for example here, um, which is the B, and for example, we have the terminal is that corresponds to name of the function call. So the actual correct function call name should be sorted. So the model will now transfer into a second type of action, which is called the generate token. And then we basically predict the sequence and the, the uh, predict some strings for this part, for this terminal node. And then we go to the second children and then so on. Like, so we, we still have a linearized program and we still have a linearized output of, but this time instead of tokens, we have action sequences. And that action sequences can be guaranteed to construct a valid tree because we follow the, the grammar production rule. So this toolkit is uh, called Trans, and it's an open source, the transition-based abstract syntax parser for semantic parsing. So it provides some convenient interface for user to specify task-dependent grammar in plain text. So here in the left side is called the ASDL, it's short for abstract syntax description language. So here you can design different ASDLs for different languages you like. So it is extensible, and it is easy to train. So, and it has guaranteed syntactically correct output. And eventually, of course, the AST will be transferred in, uh, transformed into the surface form of the code. And this is a deterministic process that have you know, readily available toolkits. So the supervised learning suffers from a, key, from a key problem, which is the data inefficiency uh, issue. As we all know, like supervised parsers and these neural networks are really data hungry. To give you this, uh, to give, however, the annotation process is really costly because these uh, natural language utterance and the target code requires not just layman, but expert uh, programmers at least having some domain knowledge in this. So for example, in the data set Kanada, we uh, take about uh, uh, 1,700 US dollars for just annotating less than 3,000 Python core, uh, code. So here is why there is uh, some research on weekly supervised learning of semantic parsers. Realizing that annotating those meaning repetitions are costly, we can just directly ask people to annotate the answers. 
because this is more easy because human brain can process those natural language queries. And so here, now the meaning representation becomes an unobserved latent variable, and we have the weak uh, supervision signal from the answers. Another way of doing this weak supervised learning is to incorporate some noisy data, for example, external resources, unlabeled data. So this approach is data augmentation. So in some existing work, we can utilize the software library uh, documentations where here you have the standard Python library found on the web, and then you, you try to generate, uh, you try to transform the function of class signatures into real world usage cases by some heuristics. And then we have stack over, over questions and answers. We associate the questions and answers as intent uh, to code snippet pairs. Those are noisy, but they come in large quantities. So the data augmentation, of course, may suffer from distribution mismatch because if you, you are using the library documentation, they are usually encyclopedic. And there's only one functional method that appears only once. But real world usages differ like in frequency of different functions. There are functions that are more popular than others. So when doing this data augmentation, a simple approach is of course, to resample the data to ensure that distribution you gain, again, from the external knowledge source to match the real world distribution. But now that we know that more data can achieve uh, more data, let's get a sense of how this can be used in the most recent advances in this topic. So we have GitHub Copilot and OpenAI Codex. So the OpenAI Codex uses no label data. They are basically all GitHub codes and deals with the code linearly also without explicitly modeling structures. So they are basically using transformer-based language models and they treat code as tokens. Here's one example of the generation like on their website. Uh, you can see here, the, in, like, there are still some supervision that may occur naturally in the data. For example, in a well-formatted code, there will be comments that uh, showcases what this program or function is about. And also there are naming conventions and also semantic namings, variable names and function names that can provide signals. So this combined with a large amount of data is the power of pre-training. And you can see that in this example, uh, the dot string or the comments here provides some example inputs. So here the example inputs also gives the model some hint like how, of how the argument variable would be looking like. So this is similar to what programming uh, synthesis is doing. And also you can see here in this example, this, um, this data, this model that is trained on a large like the GitHub data can handle text to SQL as well, because you can see that the database schema, the table is actually given in the context as in the first uh, uh, function. And then you can do the queries because the model has some knowledge about that. However, pre-training comes at a price. The codex for Python training data contains 45 million public repositories. And all, all the data, the code text files alone is about 179 gigabytes. The model itself contains uh, 12 billion parameters. And you can see, as you can see here, uh, the X scale is a log scale. So the parameters are increasing by increasing parameters uh, like exponentially, we, we, we gain nearly basically linear performance gain. So uh, what if we do not have access to this amount of data? And so this is just to say that do not regard that some of the previously introduced model that utilizes inductive bias or tree structures are useless because they may help when you have fewer data in your domain. So as a recap, this is the general workflow of a semantic parser. So, yeah, and then I think Shu Yan will talk a little bit about uh, language as listed. Yeah. Are, there, are there any questions for Chris? I can see questions. Mm 
you mean this? Uh, sorry, let me, uh, you mean this one, right? So the basically, if it's a very simple sequence to sequence parsing um, program, it will not have states or anything because it's only treating like natural language and yeah, single occurrence. Yeah, and that, that's a really good question. And I think we'll answer that question more in two classes when we talk about dialogue, because in dialogue that is really, really important. Um, it's also important uh, even for things that you don't think of as dialogue, like uh, conversational assistance or, um, sorry, not conversational assistance, like um, just like asking the same question multiple times in a row. Related questions multiple times in a row, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. There are also like uh, interactive space of uh, the mental parsing that I said, like CoSQL, which requires uh, like a dialogue space parsing for the mental parsing. Yeah. But um, in, in test driven dialogue, basically you have a state of like the things that you know. And um, most models now, nowadays are. Kind of like sequence sequence or like semantic parsing models that additionally conditioned by the state. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, sorry, what could you restate the question? Like, I, Yeah, so let me let me ask the question, is it easy for, easier for you as a programmer to program with only language primitives or to program with an API? Yeah, so I think it's probably the same answer for ML models. Um, and in fact, I think that's a big change that's happened in programming in general for humans um, as well. And it's part of the reason why I think writing programs automatically that do anything interesting is even feasible now because there's so many like APIs that are exposed to anybody who uses the Python ecosystem or maybe the Java ecosystem. Uh, so now in a way, writing complex problems has become more of a problem of information retrieval uh, than a problem of actually writing down complicated algorithms and stuff like that in many cases. However, if you get to the case where you have to write a complicated algorithm, um, I'm pretty certain that Codex will not do very well at that, although I, I haven't tried it myself. Like, let's say um, if you fed Codex programming contest questions, I bet it would get some of them, but most, uh, but not very many of them uh, for precise correct reasons. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question though. I think uh, it, it'd be, Interesting to see what the big models uh, do with more complex things that require complex reasoning. So, um, and I just got uh, I, I just got access to the copilot previews. So. <laughs> we're we're going to try that out. Okay, so uh, next I'm going to introduce some more uh, language condition execution tasks, especially in the like uh, embodied uh, scenarios. So, language is a very natural way to communicate with the machines. It's very common nowadays that we use, uh, we, we just talk to Alexa or the Siri to ask them to accomplish some task for us. So the language con condition, the execution task refers to interpret and execute the nature language instructions by express, expressing some intent. So the nature language to code is sort of this language condition uh, execution task. And uh, what I'm going to introduce is the, like the instruction for, is more like a instruction following setting. 
where we want to generate action plus arguments given the nature language intents. So this is more in the embodied scenario where we, when one action is issued, the uh, state will transfer to another, uh, will transfer. So uh, here I'm presenting a few popular benchmarks. The first one is the room to room data set where given some nature language instructions, uh, navigate the agent through the environment and uh, reach the goal uh, location. So the action here is, uh, are like the left, basically like move the camera to left, to right, to up, down, and forward. Uh, as you can see here, there's basically no argument for each of the action, just move the body of the agent or the camera. And uh, here is one example, uh, maybe it's not very visible, but basically this nature language instruction is leave the bedroom and enter the kitchen, walk forward and uh, take left at the coach stop in front of the window. And uh, the expected, expected uh, uh, action sequence is, is showed in the video. So another data set is uh, the Alfred data set, which uh, give, given some nature language instructions, navigate through the environment, navigate the agents through the environment and interact with the object to achieve some goal states. So the action here, some of the actions here are quite similar to the room to room data set, like you move a hand, rotate the left and rotate the right, uh, or look up and down. But what they introduce, uh, uh, additionally are some interactive uh, actions like pick up object, put object, open object, close object, and others. So in this way, the, the state of some object will also change. It's not just about the position and the camera degree of the agent itself. So, uh, the inter so as I said, uh, there should be some arguments for these actions too. So in the Alfred data set, the arguments are presented as 2D masks, uh, like 2D tensors in the current region. So for example, if the uh, action close is issued, the model, the agent has to predict the sum mask in, the, in its current region to indicate which object it want to interact with this closed action. And uh, here is one example. Uh, so the Alfred data set provides two level of instructions. The first one is the more high level uh, instruction, which is just one sentence, like put a microwave tomato in the sink. But what it actually requires is to basically heat the, uh, heat the tomato with microwave first, then move it to the sink. Um, they also provide step-by-step -step instructions. And I feel like most of them will be very beneficial for the uh, navigation because uh, it will tell like the specific location of some object. Um, and uh, like on the right hand side is the, the video that demonstrates how this uh, task can be accomplished and is uh, one of the desired predictions from the model. So next I'm going to introduce briefly introduce some like very basic or very common method in this kind of uh, language condition, the execution task. So similar to nature language code, um, one like commonly used model is a sequence to sequence model uh, and mostly with attention. So uh, there are basically two components because it's a sequence to sequence model. So the first one is the encoder that encodes the nature language instructions. And you can use whatever the most powerful sequence uh, encoding method, uh, encoding model, like before it might be uh, ASTM and now it can be transformed. So basically the encoder will encode the nature language to some high, dimen high dimensional uh, embeddings. The decoder predicts one action and its corresponding arguments uh, here on the right hand side is uh, like the action and the arguments. Conditional many components. The first one is the weighted nature language uh, based because the nature language express some intents of the, of the task. So it must refer to the nature language for the prediction of the next action. And uh, it will also uh, condition on the current state and in Alfred is mostly the visual information and you can use whatever uh, encoder you want with this visual information. 
there can be some other states like the like the thing in your inventory and others based on whatever uh, based on the task you have. Also, the actions from the last step or uh, last few time steps can also be helpful because uh, the issue of actions uh, are often uh, correlated with each other. For example, if I uh, if I open the microwave, uh, it's very likely later I will turn on microwave or uh, put put the food to the microwave. So. Um, this is like a very general or like very popular baseline model for this kind of task. And there are also ways to improve the baseline models. So as Bob said, like language is just uh, sometimes we, we miss a lot of things in nature language and language is often underspecified. It is very challenging to learn the mapping between the nature language and the actions from a limited amount of annotations. I think it's uh, like a very general issue with the supervised method. So in this speaker follower model, they introduce two components. So the first one is the follower model, which uh, is the base model that generates the actions given the nature language. It's just like all the other models. Uh, but they additionally introduce a speaker which generate nature language given the actions. In the training time, they first train the speaker with the ground truth annotation of the uh, uh, the root and the like ground truth uh, instructions. So basically, the speaker will generate the nature language given the root uh, show. So the next thing is the uh, follower training, where originally they only have one uh, nature language and the root pairs. But now, since they already uh, introduced another speaker, uh, they, uh, they, they train the speaker so they can further sample roots and use the speaker to generate more nature language. And these two uh, data can be combined together to train the follower. As you can see here, it's mostly like a data augmentation because um, the ground truth root can be very limited and they might not, not cover a lot of roots in the environment. But by sampling more roots in the environment, um, it basically can help, uh, like it can facilitate the training. So the third step is the inference, inference step. So normally we only have the follower that's given the nature language instruction and generate the root. But here they still uh, incorporate the speaker here. So basically after the follower propose a few candidate roots, the speaker will try to rescore these roots based, uh, based, uh, based on uh, the nature language and the candidate roots. It's kind of like a pragmatic follower uh, because uh, the pragmatic follower should choose a route through the environment uh, that has very high probability uh, of having the speaker model to issue that instructions. Um, so as I said, it's more like a, a, it's, uh, it has an idea of data augmentation. It also enforces the cons consistency between the nature language and actions. But as you can see here, uh, in the inference type, they actually should propose a few candidate routes, which might be expensive uh, in the real world deployments because the robot has to try each of the candidates first and return the state to the speaker for the rescoring. So there can be like uh, probably other ways to do so. Uh, this is kind of an open question. Um, so there are many um, evaluation matrix. So basically for more navigation based method, it's mostly evaluated su success weighted by the action or the past weight, because uh, eventually we want the path to be short. Um, if it's very long, it might just search too much and get to the uh, goal, it might be very inefficient. And also, um, they are uh, measured to measure the consistency with the reference path, because uh, due to the creation of the data set, if you just do like very brutal search, you can also reach the uh, goal state. So there's a thing that is to stay with the instructions 
and therefore stay with the reference text. And for like the um, more interactive or uh, or data set with more interactions, the task or the su subtasks of successful rate uh, is one measure. Like for Alfred, uh, we can basically compare the state after execution of actions with the ground truth state to see how many objects reach their final state. For example, if you want to heat a potato, you will check whether at the end of the day, your agent make the potato to be hot, uh, then it's cold. There are also other tasks uh, that fall into this category. It can be like a mobile phone operation, um, like, uh, like operate the pixel, pixel phone, or the web application operations like uh, log into uh, Amazon and uh, buy something. Also, there are other like Windows or Linux system operation, um, like um, delay, delayed files, move files to other folders. And uh, I list a few reference here because uh, they already established some benchmarks for these scenarios. Uh, check that if you are interested. Okay, so uh, there's another life of work focusing on more language assisted uh, execution task. So this means the task can be completed without the text. Think about like a strategic game that you don't actually need your native language to help you. Uh, you don't need the natural language to play that game. But tasks can provide informative information to assist the learning and the task completion. So in this paradigm, there can be two extreme, extreme learning cases. So the first one is the rule that specify what to do for a specific state. And uh, on the other of this spectrum can be like just reward only that uh, a reward is provided based on the outcome of the executions. Um, so as you see, like the rule can be very nice because they're immediately, mostly immediately interpretable by the machines because most of the time, if you are issue rules, you will try to have some representation that can be immediately understandable by the machines. However, it's, it's most of the time it's, it lacks of uh, flexibility because uh, most of the time, we have to design these rules case by case, domain by domain. And uh, this will be very expensive human effort because um, like uh, it's not a, a normal person who don't understand this domain can issue this kind of rule. Uh, most of the time is the expert of that field issue those uh, uh, rules. On the other hand, rewards can be flexible because uh, we only have to design what to reward to give at the end of the day. And uh, because of this, it's kind of like human efforts. However, the reality is the reward is often sparse and is vague and abstract because it only tells you whether the outcome is good or not. So there's actually effort to design better reward functions or algorithms that can facilitate more efficient learning. So actually, even though it doesn't require the human effort for the, to design the reward, uh, probably it actually require much other time to probably like fight tune the model or like design better algorithms. So natural language is kind of something in between. It is flexible because uh, we speak, uh, it is flexible because we can like issue the natural language of multiple granularity and it because uh, we are human beings and we speak nature language very naturally. Um, it can also provide a richer learning signals because uh, as I said, we can, we can not only judge whether the outcome is good or not, we can also let the agent to know what to do next. So uh, one main usage of the language in the language assisted task uh, is to communicate the structured policy. Here I present one data set called RTFM, which provides a document for a strategic GAN. So basically um, this document provides the targeting and their members. For example, the goal of this game is to defeat the order of the forest. And in the document, it says who belongs to this team. And it also tells the effectiveness of the modifier and the weapon, like how do you beat these enemies? 
So this can probably help to uh, learn more generalizable um, representations. Mm. So intuitively for this kind of uh, language assisted task, there must be some interactions between the nature language and the state. So in this RTFM work, they propose a bidirectional filtering. As you can see, they first independently encode the uh, text and the, the vision. And next in the, like the star signal, star marks there, they fuse these two uh, signals together to uh, basically by, uh, filter the irrelevant information from one, uh, from one modality. So uh, they apply this, uh, apply this uh, shell LM square uh, multiple types in their whole pipeline. But the, like the component here is just like the interaction between and the state and the nature language. Uh, so instead of providing a document that describes the dynamic of the environment, um, this work leverage language for hierarchical control. So there are also two components. The first one is the instructor that describes what to do next. And so the instructor is uh, conditioned on the state and it can be very flexible in granularity because there's no constraint of what to issue next. So basically it can be a high level instruction that describes what to do for the next few steps. Like the one uh, say here, like build the, tower, build the tower next to the base. But it can also be very low level, like tell what is, uh, what is the execution for the next step. For example, it can be maybe collect a specific property to build the tower. Um, so the more abstract instructions, probably like this one, can generalize uh, among different scenarios, while the lower level uh, instruction can probably uh, help to execute the next few steps uh, at hand. There's also an executor that generates actions. So basically it's conditioned on the nature language in the state because the nature language provides additional information. It can potentially help uh, the learning and the task competition. Um, so we just talked about more like task dependent text as like in RTFM, they provide a document for, the, uh, for each of the GAN and uh, for the previous uh, nature language hierarchical control, they basically provide the instruction for that specific state. So, but there can actually be a lot of task independent text because like a free form text is ubiquitous among like in the world or in the open web. For example, there can be WikiHow for human daily task completion and there can be gain strategic, uh, gain strategy guidance on the like gain volumes or just whatever the website. There can also be a lot of other free form texts in the internet that can help you to uh, help you to solve the task you, you like. So the one I, sh I cited here was, uh, was the work that they read the text menu of the civilization and they help uh, to, to help the uh, generation, of, to help generate the first few steps of the one episode. So can we leverage this text information or like free form open domain text information? I think this is an open question and they might be interested, interested to think about. So first, how to obtain and encode the most relevant information for a specific task at hand? Like, um, because it's open web, then most of the text in this uh, pool will be irrelevant. How can we filter out those relevant information for the current uh, task at hand, and how can we encode that? So that, uh, how can we encode those information so that they can be helpful for the task completion? And also, like when to query these open domain resources? Um, there are also many works um, that use interactive agents that can raise hand when they have questions. So then that might be something to refer to too. Uh, yeah, there can be a lot of other interesting questions to think about in this, uh, uh, to leverage this kind of task independent text. And uh, yeah, so that is pretty much everything for my part. Feel free to ask questions, but I think we're also running out of time. 
So, okay. So the question is how this uh, model get trained? Are they trained in a supervised manner or any other manner? So uh, this is a good question. Uh, I think I missed some of the uh, training or learning strategy here. So one way is to, the, to do the supervised learning. For example, for the hierarchical language control one, they collect a lot of pairwise they collect a lot of annotations to generate the nature language and also the actions. But obviously there can be other ways like doing the reinforcement learning uh, stuff um, and the language can be used to shape the reward instead of just using the, that like comparing the outcome to get the reward. Yeah. That's a good question. So I think it will depends on the task itself. So if the, so normally there's one way to train the, like the reinforcement learning algorithm, right? Uh, like you can first train the model with supervised method, then, uh, then adapt them to the reinforcement learning method. Cause uh, so my feeling is like, there's no harm to use the supervised learning method. If there's uh, annotations there, then, you can use other more flexible method to uh, scale the model up. Yeah, so, so a couple of relevant concepts. So like supervised learning is, is basically always gonna be easier because what it means is you have exactly the answer available to you, but there's also uh, ideas like weak supervision where weak supervision is you have something that is indicative of the correct answer, but it's not actually the correct answer itself. So a good example of that would be a reinforcement learning setting where you get a reward that indicates whether you got the correct answer or not, but you don't know what the correct answer actually is. So you need to discover it. Um, so weak supervision or reinforcement learning are going to be much harder, but sometimes they're the only choice you have because you don't actually have access to like a gold standard answer. Um, that being said, uh, there are also cases where there are multiple gold standard answers. So for example, there might be a really bad action sequence that gets you, that solves uh, the problem. Like, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of unsuccessful ways to uh, like cook a meal, for example, um, but, uh, so reinforcement learning can be useful if you have imperfect annotations, for example, like, um, for example, you have uh, an, uh, an action sequence that is not ideal. Um, an example of this would be like uh, Go. Um, when DeepMind's uh, AI agent was playing Go, it started out learning directly from supervision from human experts, but eventually ended up being better than human experts because it was able to discover new things that human experts would not have been able to do. So. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of nuance to the answer to the question, but that's the basic idea. Great. Um, uh, I think we can finish up and take any other questions uh, up here outside.